If you only had one minute to give music artists the best music advice you could possibly give them, what would you say? In my experience over 25 years in making a six-figure income, there's only one answer to making a full-time income from music things only, and that is you're going to need multiple music incomes. It's the only way. Have all the income streams working for you. I showed them logic on the first night. I randomly dragged three loops over from the loop section, and it sounded great. And they were like, that's amazing. I'm like, no, it's not. It's it's It was meant to do this. It's like uh, music making for dummies. If you are wanting to get into this and you are a Spotify artist and you have a following, you better run, not type to art list and get your stuff on there right away or, or, or apply to them because they are, they are looking for artists. They don't call themselves art list for nothing. Oh, this is easy. First, you are going to need more than one income stream. Spotify and DSPs, I know that's your thing, but alone, they won't get you there. They could, they could, but they likely won't. Despite what all the gurus, like this guru and that guru, us gurus and other gurus, what, despite what we say, sync alone even isn't going to get you there. Um, any kind of sync guru, I could go off on that. Any kind of micro licensing or stock licensing or all that kind of stuff, it's not going to get you there. Performing as an artist, that could get you there, but that is a lot of work and a lot of load in, load out. Music teaching as a job or working at a church or something like that as a salary, that could get you there, but it's a lot of students, it's a lot of people that please. And then producing and or marketing for artists, it could and has, for me, been a full-time income. And it, it could be up to a six-figure income if you do it right. But that's a lot of projects at the same time and a lot of artists you got to juggle. But in my experience, over 25 years in making a six-figure income, there's only one answer to making a full-time income from music things only. And that is, you're going to need multiple music incomes. It's the only way. Have all the income streams working for you. Yeah, that's great advice. I, out of the p artists I've talked to who have had successful long careers, they never have one income stream. Like, right. I, I do know a few people who make a full time living off of streaming, which that happens, but it's super rare. Yeah. <laughs> I know other people make a full time living off of Patreon, full time living off of touring, full time living off of merch. But usually they have like five of those things at once. And the ones who do the best and have the most stability have, have multiple. And I've seen people talk about, oh, Spotify changed their algorithm and now I can't afford my rent anymore, <laughs> right? And that's that's the problem with having one income stream, even if it's a day job that you have the, you have the career in. Like even that, a lot of people think it's super safe, but what happens if there's a layoff? What happens yep. if there's and a recession? And those people who are making all 100% of their money from touring, from Spotify or whatever, they are busting it like nobody else. They are yeah. working harder at that job than than a lot of people work at their full time jobs because you have to bust it. I know people, I, I not many, but I know a few who do make a six figure plus income in sync licensing. But they have two thousand songs out there, and they are writing three a day and you know twenty a week and feeding libraries like crazy and doing trailers and doing all this kind of stuff. Yeah, when you have that kind of income, then. Then it becomes the perfect circle. I was talking about one of my videos. Create music, make passive income, create more music, passive income pays you to create music. You know, that's like a big circle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you had a 25-year career producing music, but mm -hmm. now you're focused on composition for music libraries and also clients. And I thought it'd be interesting to hear your journey transitioning from that 25-year career doing that into this whole everything you do now, composition, sync, etc. Yeah. Well, it wasn't my plan to become a producer. Like everybody, I I wasn't really ever wanting to be in a band and be like a, a star or anything like that. My goal was to, I started writing songs when I was 13. So my goal was to be to get a music publishing deal. That, there were two deals back in, in the day when before the internet. There was only two deals, a getting a record deal and becoming famous or getting a music publishing deal and getting uh, not famous, but rich. And so you could just go out on tour and make be a recording artist, or you could write songs and have a recording deal where you got paid every year just to write songs. And so those were the two big deals really everybody was trying to get, and I was on the music publishing side. But um, the problem was every time I would make a, 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 a 
a tape back then or a CD and show somebody, they'd be like, oh, that's awesome. Will you make a recording for me? And so it all became about me making recordings for people. And before I knew it, before I even, I did work corporate for a while, when I, uh, for about 10 years after I met my wife and when we were having babies and stuff. And then <laughs> after about 10 years, I was always working on the side, producing people. And finally, I met a guy who wanted me to take over his studio and take over his clients. And then I kind of did that, but then started my own websites. And I was really early. I was I kind of caught the indie wave when it was probably at its strongest around 2000, right? As CDs started to hit their zenith and start going down and the music business started to worry and the players in Nashville where I would go just because they were closest to me, but probably also LA were also starting to worry. And uh, and then at the same time, the internet was just becoming big enough to catch people. And I was early on the internet with my services about producing. And so people f were coming all over. I was in Kentucky of all places. <laughs> Lexington is where I'm from. And they were coming to there to record because I was working in a, again, niche down. I was in a certain genre. I was in Christian gospel music. So that, that niche took off around 2000. Plus, I literally bought my business from this guy four days before 9-11. I signed the papers thinking, I'm going to have a jingle business. And, a, and it was all jingles and it was commercial music. And it was just big money from, from commercial projects and stuff and, and some artists. And then 9-11 hit and all the jingle stuff died. I was literally working on a jingle with a client on 9-11 that day. And uh, then after that, the, the, the market kind of, kind of tanked for a while for, for music, um, for, for commercial music, just because of the seriousness and the crazy way that we changed as a country. But, but the artists came out of the, of the woodwork to like, they're like, it, it was a defining moment for everybody in the country. They're like, it's kind of like COVID. We're going to do something now with our lives. We're going to make an album. We're going to go to Nashville. And we're going to do this thing. And we're going to, you know, give our yeah. dreams a shot. There's no time to waste in this crazy world. So starting around 2002 through 2003, business started to expand. And then I moved to Nashville in 2005 because I was going back and forth because Lexington's only three hours away from Nashville. If I was living in Vegas, I probably would have gone back and forth to LA, but I was in uh, where I was. And so Nashville made the most sense. And plus, that's where that particular genre lives is uh, in Nashville on Music Row, basically. So yeah. that that's just, uh, and then once I got there, it was just, uh, I, I put that on the website, reorganized a new website, a new record label, and people just came flying in for for a good 15, 20 years to, to record. I still am working. I just released a guy's album on Friday and um, in that genre and his, his YouTube video today. And so mm. uh, doing, doing that still a little bit, probably about 30% of what I do is still working for people who would consider them artists. Some of them I am convincing to move over to the side of licensing because I think it's, it's a, it's a better, it's probably the better way to make money in the long run. Um, artists is all about the front end. You you put a product out, you you bust it, you you get out there and do marketing, and you hope you make some money when it when it when it, you know. And then there's a very very long tail, hopefully, with it. Yeah. Uh, but um, there's really no back end. You know, I mean, there's pennies from Spotify and your BMI checks and stuff like that. But licensing offers you the chance to make money in the front, and it may let you make money in the back, uh, decent money in the back end. So that's what I'm, I'm, I've kind of like started to convert clients into partners and we've been, uh, signing things with libraries and, and starting down that road. But, um, and, and, and to be honest, I think the artist thing took a big hit in, in with COVID and I've had less people really, and with the demise of the CD, the CD basically died for, it was like the final nail in the CD's coffin, I think COVID. And now you can't give a CD away, even to a music person. They will look at it. They will take a picture of it. If you got a QR code on the back, they are. They will do that. <laughs> and then they will say, thanks and hand you the CD. They used to go, oh, thank you. Can I have this? Now they go, oh, that's cool. Here you go. And they hand it right back to me. So um, there's, it's not even that impressive when I, when I take a book of all the books I have, of, of all the CD projects I've made, and I lay them out in yeah. front of students and people, and they're like, that's cool. 
are they on are they on Spotify? You know, so uh, that's right. it's just not a world anymore. So that world has kind of changed, and I think it's harder than ever to be an independent music producer, unless you just love working with artists. And I think I am kind of past that. I think I've, that's that's a, yeah. a thing I did for a long time, and I was happy to do it. Um, but I kind of went back to school about about five or six years ago to get my actually about 10 years ago to, to get serious about getting back to school. And that's where I thought maybe I could teach. And then I just fell back in love with composition again. And then I found out about licensing and I was like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to be <laughs> a composer and an educator and that's it. Goodbye. That's it. That's the life from here on. Nice. Out. Yeah. Wow, man. <laughs> yeah. It's just funny on the CD front where you say you can't even give them away. I ran a free plus, a free plus shipping and handling funnel last year to literally like give CDs away. Mm -hmm. All they had to do was pay for shipping. Um, and I was surprised how many people actually would still buy CDs because I would they signed? offer them. They were signed CDs, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so they were signed free CDs for six ninety five shipping in the U.S. only, and then I would upsell them on three more CDs for fifteen bucks, which is a great deal. But profit margins on CDs are like amazing, uh, and I sold eight hundred doing awesome. that. Yeah. And it was surprising to hear though people's. Like he, people would email me, they send me screenshots when they get their order, they tag me on social media. And some of them would actually like listen, like to tell me like, oh, I have this in my car, I listen to it every day. Uh, and then other people would tell me like, I just wanted this to add to my like collection. Like they have, they like yeah. collect CDs or they, they want something physical signed. And I thought back to the CDs that I've bought in the past like eight years or something, <laughs> which is only like two, because if I've been streaming only for a long time, mm -hmm. every like Tool's latest album, just because they do the crazy packaging. Yeah. And then I bought an album by a band called Rishlu because they sold it earlier, meaning yeah. like you could get the whole album now or wait a long time for it to be trickled on in streaming. Yeah. And so I've been telling people like if you the physical can work, but it you you have to add incentives to it. Like, oh, you can get the whole album now or wait a year for it to be on Spotify. Yeah. Or and you can get it signed. And by the way, the CD has this cool thing whatever it is like i added a qr code in my cds that when they scanned it would give them to like an extra portal full of extra free goodies so it was almost like an nft ticket in yeah. a way um but yeah i i feel like there was a golden era before where like cds were super mainstream and the profit margins are like amazing like 90 plus percent <laughs> yeah because and, they would uh, buy they would make a thousand of them and they would cost about fifteen hundred dollars, and so they sold them for fifteen dollars. When they cost them a dollar fifty each, and yeah. uh, they would go out. And a lot of my people had captive audiences because they were at churches or they were at, at concerts or something like that. And that was the only way to to take something of the artist. You know, I think people probably do better now with T-shirts at their shows than they do with CDs. And it's a shame because the music, you know, even. Uh, uh, CD quality, which is, you know, 1644 still sounds better than most things that you will hear on your, when you're driving around, listening on Bluetooth through your phone, right. it, it does sound better. Now, one thing that I did on a recent album, and I will be doing it again, likely when Jacob Collier's album comes out, because <laughs> I'm a big fan of his, but I did this on a jazz album last year, just for, just for almost like scientific purposes. I didn't really do a, a video about it, but I bought the high. I went to HD tracks and bought the high res versions. Uh, I think it was twenty. I don't know twenty four um, twenty four ninety six or something like that. And uh, and I, I did a, a test between that, between CD quality and between Spotify's highest quality. Cobuzz is another one that does really super high quality. I don't think I tested title, but and and there was just no. No question that the the high res tracks are just gold. I mean, you can hear everything. Yeah. But you know, when we're in our car, do we hear everything? When we're in, you know, when we're playing it through a, a mono Bluetooth speaker, are we are we hearing everything? When I have students walking around, I go, to, I teach at this um, recording school here in Orlando, and they walk around, and go listen to my new beat, and I'm like, on your phone? I said it sounds very tinny. I'll give you that. And they're like, no, man, listen, listen how, how, you know, how it hits or whatever. I'm like, nah, it doesn't hit. Um, but that's, that's our culture now, you know? Yeah. yeah most people are listening. A, a lot of people listen on phone speakers yeah. and a lot of people listen on crappy headphones and crappy speakers. Yeah. And 
laptop speakers and uh, yeah. So the, they don't care about the quality. They just want unlimited music for 10 bucks a month. <laughs> yeah. And there's no, there's no really, um, we would like, we, you and me who make this music, we would like the, the, the streamers to, to jump up and have high res streaming, but I, we're yeah. the only ones who care. They don't, uh, the consumers don't care. My wife doesn't care. She could care less yeah. if, if, if it's high quality, she just wants to, you know, put it on yeah. and go about her business around the house, sweeping and <laughs> sitting outside and stuff where, you know, the, the audio quality doesn't matter. So, and, and that was what, what the, my whole artist, that world of artists from 2000 to about 2017, 2018, they could go out and do gigs. They could be paid to do the gigs and they could make two or $300 off their table sales. Easy. And it, I mean, if they would go out and do it, but they could, and, and it wasn't that hard. It, it's just, they, they had to, they had to do it. And, and, and now it's just not something they can do. And so most artists are looking at this as there's just no reason to do this, except to maybe release a, a Spotify single and tell everybody on Facebook, that's about the best they can do now <laughs> and make a music video, which nobody watches. So. Yeah. Yeah. Music videos are another whole topic we probably talk for 20 <laughs> minutes about but uh let's pivot a little bit okay. uh what are some different types of music licensing just for people who have no idea about what you do and everything you've said thus far has been gibberish to them <laughs> yeah well that's okay it was gibberish to me when I first heard about it. Um, it was on a podcast. I think it was uh, Bobby Osinski's podcast. I don't know if you're listening to that podcast, but it's a great podcast. He's kind of an engineer in LA, and he has a kind of a music tech podcast. You should listen to it, of all people. But um, he's it. always interviewing people, and he inter inter interviewed this lady who was starting to talk about something she called sync licensing, which is providing music for sync to specifically television, film, um, advertising, and gaming, you know, like EA Sports gaming, not not like just you know two D gaming on on computers. There is that, but we'll we'll get to that in a minute. But the main one I I heard was that there were CBS shows that had thirty thousand dollar budgets for music for their show, and they got to cut that up between the Rolling Stones song they want to play at the beginning, you know, to really get the audience hooked and stuff that everybody knows, and then there's going to be all these other things. There's going to be crash scenes and chase scenes and there's going to be you know dramatic moments and there's going to be light-hearted moments and there's going to be like a jukebox playing music in the background there's all these music uses they need to fill out this show and they're going to be finding that music from somewhere whether it's someone uh the music supervisor of the show knows or the music supervisor goes to a library to a trusted library that they go to all the time and finds the right tune for it a variety of ways they could go and find these songs. And this is basically what we call sync licensing, synchronizing music to TV, film, um, gaming, high-end gaming, and or uh, advertising is a big one. I mean, that's the one that probably pays the most. When we think of the, the, the least, probably is TV, because TV, you could get a song license and only get maybe five or six hundred, five to a th 500 to a thousand up front. And then there could be residuals on the back end through your PRO, like BMI or ASCAP, that would pay that money as it's played and it's performed on TV. But there's a sliding scale mm -hmm. about that. Just like um, in the old days, well, still, you get something on CBS, ABC, I'm doing a brief right now for ABC, and a brief is when they make a call for a type of song they need and they send it out to all the people that they trust to give them good music and it tells you what they need and what it needs to sound like and all this kind of stuff. And so I'm, I'm helping out trying to give some music to this Christmas special um, miniseries, but it's going to be on ABC, which is different than being on ABC on cable, which is different from being on uh, Disney Plus or... Um, where else would ABC be on, uh, on maybe on Hulu or something like that? Because just like our friends Netflix, our, our friends Spotify and Apple, they play pennies and yeah. pieces of pennies per play. And Netflix and all the rest, and sometimes we tend to use Netflix like we use Spotify. Spotify, we say Spotify, and we really mean all DSPs. Or we say Netflix, yeah. they're the Kleenex of, of the, that particular thing. And uh, so like Netflix is like, you know, the, all DSPs in our minds. 
and they pay pennies because they're not regulated versus television, which has been paying this stuff for a long time, or I should say network television and or cable television. So um, that's the first one. And you can get 500, 1,000 plays. Or like me, you could get something on a Hulu Christmas movie that was on last season and get a million plus views on this little, you know, the Baker's Christmas special or something like that. And uh, it was one of those um, romantic movies. And make, I don't know, $38 for a million plus views. Now, I was probably one of... 50 songs in there. There was a different Christmas song playing every five seconds. Yeah, because your, your song might literally only be playing for five seconds yep. or 10 seconds. Yep. And, and I, I think mine assume, was, yeah. Do they do variable payment based on how long it's in Absolutely. there and like how early it is in the ep- So I'm, I'm guessing like a title track that like comes in 30 seconds in or something pays a lot more than. I don't know about. Then again, if, if the Rolling Stones, as you said, like. They're going to get they more. They can negotiate. Yeah. yeah. They're going to have to go get pay a, a thing to the label for that. But those of us who are just in libraries and stuff, they can they can get less. Or if they know, let's say a music supervisor knew me particularly, and they knew that I have a certain kind of song that they need. They can, hey Eric, I can do this. I got five hundred, or I got a thousand, or I got two thousand. And so that could happen. Or you could get five seconds in the middle of some Lifetime movie and get paid thirty bucks, or. 10 bucks or five bucks or 150 bucks. Yeah, I mean, it's just all over the place and how it's calculated, just like BMI, nobody knows. It's a hazy mystery how that all works, but um, it does work enough. Again, it's it's gonna be about quant- quality and quantity. But um, yeah, so, so, film, so TV is the first part. And this is just, we've just talked about on TV so far. And then there's film, which usually pays one payment up front because in the United States, you don't get royalties every time a film plays. You might overseas uh, if you have somebody collecting for you overseas or it comes in. But in the United States, it's usually the front end. They just pay you a, a sync fee for the beginning. They say, we're going to use your song in this movie and we're going to pay you $5,000 or $10,000 or something like that. Mm-hmm. And then the next biggest one would be, would be advertising. And that couldn't be huge. I mean, you could be talking about anything from 20 to 30,000, almost almost had a $29,000 sale last year with a company that wanted to use it and buy it out for their for their company and or get an Apple commercial. That's six figures. You know, the, the Apple spinning around is going doo, 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 and, and then there's some kind of like indie singer thing happening along with the phone spinning around. That's a hundred grand, yeah. easy, six figures. So advertising is probably- It's, it's amazing to me that you could get one deal or like, let's say two deals, like if you get a two $20,000 deals in a year, like that alone, yeah. plus all the other little tiny things and residuals you have is, is like a career, which yeah. is amazing when you compare that to being an artist when you're like, I need to get a million streams a month to make a living, or I need to get you know, 100 CD sales a month, or I need to get 100 people on a Patreon, or I need to play 100 shows. You know, it's like you can get like two to 20 different things per year and like, Make a living, but I'm guessing. Or you could do all of these. Getting each of these deals, there's probably a ton of work that goes into nailing one of those, right? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a couple of different ways to get to it. Number one, and the one that I've done the most is finding libraries that are needing these songs, and they just um, they they put them in their library and music supervisors. It's kind of like it's kind of like their version of stock music. They just go to these libraries that they trust, that they know the quality is going to be super high. It's going to be it's going to be bands and artists and or composers that are going to have really high-end stuff. Artists are doing very well with sync right now. I mean, if you are an indie artist and you want to, to get into a world where it's not dependent on you waking up and going and doing a show, it's not dependent on you running ads for Spotify, but you and you should do all those things anyway as an artist, of course. But this is a third way that you can um, make some money and make money in the front and the back end. And they love, music supervisors are the new A&R. They are the people who are looking for that new artist that nobody is using yet on their show. And if they find that yeah. artist, it's like, look who I just found. I just found this artist, just like A&R people do. I just, I discovered this artist and I'm gonna put them on our label. 
And music supervisors are doing that too. I'm going to, and so are libraries, music libraries to say, and, you know, Artlist or some of these libraries are saying, I, we discovered this artist, we're going to bring them in here and they're going to make money for us and for themselves. And so uh, it, it's the new A&R and every artist should be thinking about this. Every, uh, I talk to my students who are coming in, I want to be a beat maker. I want to be a rapper. I want to be a, an audio engineer. Fine, do all those things, but put those beats in, in libraries, and there are people talking about that, people like my friend Clint over at Clint Music. I don't know if you know Clint, but um, you know he, oh. he talks about this very thing. Um, and so, yeah, man, and, and, and there's also the world of, of video games for like uh, EA and for uh, all the different companies that do games. I haven't really got into that yet, as far as I know. I mean, any of those games could go to one of my libraries and, and use one of my songs for their games, but uh, I haven't been involved in that yet. Right. Yeah, I mean, video games use a lot of music, but yeah. at least the games I know are using custom-made music, mm -hmm. and they're hiring someone who makes video game music for a living. Like, uh, who's the guy who did the soundtrack for Doom? Uh, Mick Gordon. Yeah. Uh, he like everyone knows Mick Gordon now because like he did the Doom soundtrack. <laughs> but like, th and there's a lot of other people like that. But there are some games that. But if it's use, like GTA like, or something. You know, yeah, or and NBA 2K, NBA 2K, or, especially. Yeah. And uh, the, the, a lot of times they're looking for, you know, songs that are well known, but a lot of times they're also got budget to get a lot of indies and get them in there and yeah. talk about a place for hip hop. If you are a hip hop artist uh, and beat maker and stuff, you want to get in. I would be trying to focus on how you can. There's a there's an EA games here in town. EA Sports is, is over just across town here and it's hiring a lot of. Wow people. It's hired people away from our school. It's hired all sorts of people that do music and different things. So it, it exists. And it's just not something that uh, I'm kind of a fringe guy. I make music in a lot of the weirder places. I mean, I do pop and, and some of my best stuff has been pop, but also holiday stuff and orchestral stuff and classical stuff and country and <laughs> every, I'm cutting two more countries. I'm, I'm tracking tomorrow in Nashville with players in a, in a studio. I'm not going to be there. I was going to do it remotely. But, um, you know, we're cutting country. We're cutting Target commercial sounding stuff. We're cutting um, <laughs> uh, a Prince type of song. We're cutting, it's kind of a multi-use <clears throat> tracking session day. But, yeah, it's going to be fun. Yeah. So, new artist hears this call. Yep. And they're like, wow, this sounds awesome. I want to do this. Mm -hmm. What is like steps one through five for them to start trying to pursue making money off of sync? Well, there is a lot to do. And, um, you know, we talk about sync and we also, on my channel, I talk about um, another kind of sync. I call it micro sync. A lot of other people call it stock music licensing. And this is another thing that you can get into. But if we just stay on, we'll talk about that in a minute because that's a whole other thing. If you're talking about artists want to get into sync licensing, well, the first thing you've got to have is original music. And, and what's funny is a lot of these TV shows are looking for original artists with original sounding music. And these days, it can be anything, anything, punk, polka, uh, funk, disco. Um, here's the beautiful thing about television. We are in an age of television where there's just as many shows based in the 70s, 80s, 60s, 50s. Uh, there's there's shows like Loki who have every are in every time period. There are <laughs> shows that are ev everywhere. So there's Mad Men. Uh, there is Miss Maisel. You know all of that stuff which was based in the '60s or the '50s or whatever, and they need music for that. And it, it, it used to be when somebody came to you and they had a corny sounding '70s song, you're like, dude, what are you gonna do with this? This nobody's gonna be interested in this at any record label. Well, we're not talking about record labels anymore. We're talking about people who are hungry for that punk Christmas uh, song that sounds great that they could plug right into a TV show that needs a punk Christmas song for whatever reason. And so yeah. there's just so much opportunity. And guess what? That world is not changing. And Newsflash, this is a Newsflash here on, well, by, by the time this airs, it won't be a Newsflash, but I just saw that they are settling <laughs> the strike today with the writers in Hollywood, it just came across wow. the thing, which means for us sync people, we got to get on the ball because they're going to be needing music again because everything's been kind of shut down. But now they're going to be open again. 
And listen, there is so much opportunity out there for, for, for music, for so many networks that have so many original shows that have so many, we, we, you know, we have so many original shows, we don't even know what to watch. I literally have to keep right. a list on my phone of all my lists, <laughs> of, of all my Netflix lists and all that kind of stuff and remember what to watch. Otherwise, I'll just sit through and watch Netflix previews for an hour and go, okay, I'm going to bed. And so, you know, we've got to, we've got to uh, know that there is a lot of possibility out there for music. Now, how do they get started? Well, same way they get started with ads for Facebook. They watch you, right? You go online and you find people talking about it. There are lots of people talking about it. Now, who you decide to listen to is up to you. I talk about it as one of the music incomes that I tell people they should do. I also push Spotify a lot, that people should be getting their music on Spotify for a lot of reasons, but because it's another income stream. But um, if they're going to get into sync, you better do some study on it. And the best place to study on it, I think, and to get the freshest information is YouTube. You're going to find the people mm -hmm. talking about it that know what they're talking about. And it's not just me. There's people like Jesse. There's people like uh, Clint. There's people like Stevie B. There's people like Dave Croft. That means uh, there's all sorts of people. And each of them have a little bit of different, like uh, slightly different focus and weigh in. Um, there's people that I know who really talk about going straight to music supervisors, forget libraries, go straight to the source, go straight to the music buyers and sell your music, which I don't disbelieve in. I just, I might be too lazy or old to do that. You know, my hustle days may have, besides hustling on YouTube, which is fairly easy, I could just do that right here. But my hustle <laughs> days of going to LA and, and hustling conferences, I did that 20 years ago when I hustled production at, at conferences, you know. Um, and, and to be honest, you know, I feel I, I'm, I'm moving more towards a composer. It just so happens that licensing is an outlet for that composing. So if you're looking for places mm -hmm. to study, be very careful how much you spend when you're, when you're meeting new or, or finding new YouTubers or gurus in this space, because um, there are people offering $6,000 courses and stuff like that. And you're not going to make any money at first. It takes, it is a long game, Andrew. This is the longest game. A Spotify single you can make in a day and put out tomorrow, almost literally. And a, a, a song that gets into a show, unless you have connections directly with a music supervisor that needs that song today, then you're yeah. talking about putting it into a library, hoping you get in the library. Then once you get in the library, then accepting an album, then it getting ingested into the library, which could take months. Then it getting found by somebody watching a TV show that wants, that's a music supervisor for a TV show that wants that song. Then getting that song into the TV show and hoping that a cue sheet gets written right because that's how they report back to BMI that it got in and how you get paid in BMI. And then waiting <laughs> nine months for BMI to process that and get that to you. It is a long game. Yeah. It's years long. And at first, you're not going to make much. I'm, I'm kind of like, talk. I, I'm talking about my journey on licensing on my channel. That's basically what my channel has been about is on all my income source journeys. And th that's, that's one that I actively update. I just updated the other day and how it's starting to make a dent, just barely, it just, it's starting to kind of take over for stock a little bit or get close to it. So, yeah. I yeah. saw some video on your channel or on your website that the thumbnail was something like from zero to $600 a mm -hmm. month. Mm -hmm. So is that kind of roughly what you're getting now and like well, recurring BMI? Now, this is where we switch over to stock music, which if people don't know what micro sync or well, what I call micro sync, because there's a lot of other things than stock music libraries that you can make little pieces of money from. Like, well, I don't know if Sound Exchange would qualify against more radio pay, but, um, mm -hmm. you know, micro, anytime someone pays uh, pennies for your songs to use it for something. Song Trader is a good example of this. A little site yeah, I have like a that. Song Trader account. I think I've made like a hundred bucks in the past two years. <laughs> well, something. I have. I make. I probably have gotten to. I think I made four or five hundred bucks off that site last year. And it depends on how you work it. Nice. There is a lot of monetization options in there. So I call these little micro transaction transactions micro sync. But other people just. Think of these libraries that are there, and these libraries serve YouTube or YouTubers, I should say, you and me. You mm -hmm. probably have some, either you use your own music, I use my own music, but there are YouTubers that use some of these 
companies and they they buy a, a, a subscription so that they can if they're they're not music people they're just youtubers and and they have a time when they need to just show them doing a, a, a montage of stuff and they play some some hip-hop or some lo-fi or something like that and so they go to these yeah. stock sites and they get something or uh in the same way they would i go and get photos and videos when i'm doing videos and you know we need to put our b stock in there and we go get that from some Envato elements or someplace like that well there is yeah. stock music and stock audio in those sites, and you can enroll in those sites, not in Vado Elements. But Pond5 and Motion Array, and um, uh, there's yeah. there's dozens of others. And I, I talk about that in a course that I just put out recently. Subtle plug. Um, but uh, <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. but there are dozens of those. And, you know, it's not paying all my bills, of course, and I don't think it ever will yeah. be. It's a, it's a, it's a side hustle. It's a side business to all my other businesses. But you know, I'm not going to not take the ten grand I've made in about two and a half years. I'll take it. I'm not going right. to. I mean, yeah, it may. I've had months I've gotten up to six hundred. I've had months that have been a hundred, but somewhere in between is probably the average. And if I get three hundred bucks for a month, hey, that pays a car payment. That's not nothing. And right. a lot of that is stuff I put up two years ago. And um, I, I put up a lot of genre music up there, a lot of public domain music, holiday music, all sorts of things. So every holiday, like I put up patriotic music, so stuff you know sells during the patriotic times, and you get you sometimes get bigger licenses. They'll use it at the they pay bigger licenses for television or something every once in a while, not very often. But um, so that's a whole secondary kind of licensing, and people can jump in that now. I mean, you can go to Pond Five and register your music now. And I put all that's my artist I, music. I did that too. with Pond Five a couple of years ago. I was writing a lot of music back then. I mean, I still write music now, but I was like writing a lot, like I don't know, ten songs a month. I would like start, and then out of those ten, one would turn into like a song for my actual music. Mm -hmm. The other nine would just sit in a hard drive somewhere. Yeah. So I was like, why don't I just render some like loops or sections or cuts of these and throw them because I just found out about the pond five. Yeah. And, uh, as, as you said, it's not like paying, it's not like I'm not making a living off of pond five or anything, especially where they're massive cuts. They take off everything. Yes. But it was it's still like this music that I was just doing nothing with. Yep. Which all of a sudden just generated like a couple hundred bucks. And well, so there's really free. even no reason not to put your music that's on, um, Spotify on these libraries either. I mean, what's the difference, really? I mean, if you're going to get paid pennies over here, get paid pennies over here. And then the other answer with stock, though, with microsites, is content ID. You've got to enroll in the PRO for YouTube, which is called content ID. And I think it looks like I'm going to make more out of content ID, the back end, than I will from any payments from libraries by the end of the year. I'll do a report on it. Wow. But that's the way it's kind of moving right now. We'll see. But uh, the... Sometimes I could, yeah, sell a song on Pond5 and I get $1.75. Who cares? But that song could then be put on Content ID and through, I use a company called Identify, and they take 30%, I get 70%. And I don't, I didn't pay anything to be in there. I don't pay anything to them. They just go out and search YouTube. Apparently, supposedly they search, they search Facebook and Instagram too, but I, I've only seen YouTube stuff. Yeah. But number one, you get paid if someone hasn't monetized the video. So if they don't have a thousand subscribers, which a lot of people don't, who are trying to make YouTube channels, or they just don't monetize their channel, there are people who don't, and you will get the pay from uh, from there. And depending on how many views, again, it's a little unexact science. I can't quite figure it out yet, but yeah. uh, I've had two two hundred dollar months just on 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 content ID this month, and and it, sometimes it's mm -hmm. just from one video you get you know, hundreds of videos that have your music on it, but some of them are monetized, so you get zero. But then others, you get a penny, you get, you know. So there's this whole How other does it work BMI with, with for... Uh, ID? Yeah, yeah. How does it work with Content ID? Like if you sell a song on Pond5 or whatever site, and all of a sudden someone like, they feel like, oh, I just purchased this song yeah. to use it in my video, and now you're claiming all the money from this video. How they does can, that work? They can, they, there are mechanisms for them to go uh, to the library and say, Hey, I paid for this. I don't want to put it. And they'll give them, they'll whitelist their channel. So, okay. Gotcha. Yeah. It's, gotcha. it's so, pretty, so, so that's fair play and there's an easy mechanism to go yep. and resolve it. Yep. Cool. Yeah. It, it was, it was a wild west for a minute 
And I didn't jump into it because I was afraid that people would not choose my music, and, and especially on Motion Array, which is probably, um, if you've heard of Artlist, and a lot of people have, it's kind of that's a kind of a high end stock library, but it's almost like the, the it's like Spotify meets um, licensing kind of over there. And they are really artist based. And I would suggest to your listeners, if you are wanting to get into this, and you are a Spotify artist and you have a following, you better run, not type to art list and get your stuff on there right away or, or, or apply to them because they are, they are looking for artists. They don't call themselves art list for nothing. You take out the L, it's artist. And when you go to their site, it yeah. looks like a record label. It's just all your age people, you know, and, and a few of mine, but not, yeah. not as many because they're, guess what? They're looking for artists. That hasn't changed in, in this whole thing. <laughs> and so they're looking for artists to be on there and, they bought Motion Array, which was another um, uh, stock music library, and, and, and stock everything. Twenty Some of these libraries, like Pond5, or especially, well, Pond5 is, but yeah. Motion Array has video and, and all these other ones, all these other stock things you can get, templates now, for different things. Artlist has Artgrid, and Artlist has like a samples thing now, and the Loops library. Yeah. Yeah. Rain sounds, et cetera. <laughs> yep. All this stuff. It, it's just, and, and then the AI thing is coming into all of them now where you can type in what you want and, and they'll give you a song that sounds like that. And they're training off of our music. Now, I talked about this on my podcast this week that um, one of them, Audio Sparks, which is another one of these companies, they now say, we're going to let them trade off your music, but you're going to be paid. Okay, we'll see if I'm going to be paid. It could be more pennies, another income stream, and they're all good. So if that if that turns into a thing where they can have a some kind of formula that says, hmm, we gave this person music and it was kind of trained off this guy and this guy and this guy and this guy, we're going to pay those guys, you know, a percentage of uh, whatever their yeah. half would be or percentage would be. And it's probably going to be very low, but still, if we can make AI work that way where they are training off our music, and uh, you're seeing this all over the place where people, I saw another AI thing that has AI voices and the, the people who put their voices in, Kits AI, I think is what it was called. And the people who put their voices yeah. in, they get paid, paid 20% of anything that sells with their voice on it, kind of like a background singer would be paid. <laughs> At a, at a session. <laughs> Actually, more than what a background singer yeah. would be paid at a session. Except now so. they can effectively have infinite work, right? Because before, doing session work, would it's gated by your time and all that. But this, it's like yeah. if you have an AI clone of your voice, someone can use it. You have infinite scalability, even if you're only making two-tenths of the amount of money. You're putting like yourself you, you, out you there to work. You could release 5,000 songs a year with that. No yeah. problem, because you're not working. It's passive. The machine is doing it. Yeah, but it's passive income for the artist, for the singer who yeah. lent their voice and is getting 20% if they're indeed getting 20%. So there's a lot of opportunities for income from AI. And we tend to look at it as, oh, it's going to it's gonna take over for us. Well, it's only going to take over if you're, if you're terrible or if, <laughs> if you don't really put work into being a good artist. And uh, as a composer who has some confidence in my composition, I'm not scared of AI. I'm not at all, yeah. you know, and I even use AI tools, uh, especially in Photoshop and stuff like that. So I feel like in the micro sync world and all those libraries, the type of music that's going to be most replaced and killed off is going to be the low hanging, easy to make ambient pad music, Zen beats. meditation, lo-fi beats, like just the, the simple stuff that can the, basically, the, the stuff that the people who are making it are just brainlessly just like making Probably. it. Not the actual artistic stuff where people are spending well, like time and energy on. The people who are dragging loops over in Logic are probably the people who are going to be replaced by AI. Yeah. Because an AI could just... I Do you know why I did this for my class when I showed them Logic recently? I showed them Logic on the first night. I randomly dragged three loops over from the loop section. And it sounded great. <laughs> Yeah. And they were like, that's amazing. I'm like, no, it's not. It's it's It was meant to do this. It's like uh, music making for dummies. And I mean, a five-year-old could pull this over and, and make this. And so so will AI be able to do that. And tomorrow, we start music theory in this class. And that's where we start to learn how to make music with your fingers and not with loops. And so it, it kind of changes the game. And that's where the talent has to come in, you know. Right, right. 
So pivoting again, okay. you seem to understand music royalties pretty good, and a lot of artists don't, myself included. Like, I know a bit, but a lot of artists know absolutely nothing. Okay. <laughs> so uh, and for, when I say nothing, I mean they put their music on Spotify through DistroKid or whatever, and they collect their dis- distribution money, and then that's it. Okay. So there's PROs, mm-hmm. and then there's companies like SongTrust, and then there's companies like SoundExchange. And then there's Harry Fox, and then then there's this whole sync thing. So like, what what is like the whole scope of an artist uploading songs to Spotify? What are the different royalties they they get, and how do they get them? There's about four broad categories of royalties. First, there's the song, the song rights, or I should say, the song money that you get if you are the writer of a song you should get whatever the writer gets. And that comes through what we call performance royalties and usually is paid through performance royalties. And performance royalties are someplace that are collected someplace like BMI, ASCAP, CSAC, and in other countries like in the UK, it's PRS and other other countries. It works a little differently as you get out into the world. Across Europe, it, it gets weird. Uh, and, and there's a thing called neighboring rights, but we'll get to that in a minute. But the main thing that we're worried about is that who is the owner of the song who is the the writer of the song not the owner we'll get to the owner in a minute but the writer of the song so you register with one of your societies like like bmi i'm with bmi i've been with them for 30 years and so i will every time i put a song anywhere on on a stock thing up to spotify or whatever i am putting it um in my pro first i'm just um listing it there it's almost, it's not a copyright, but it is some sort yeah. of proof uh, that, you know, and it's there in case Spotify wants to pay me pennies for that because Spotify pays PRO pennies uh, as far as rights. Yeah. Um, now, your, uh, and it gets confusing because people think distro kid money is money that you're, you're some kind of royalty. It's not royalty, it's just sales. It's like selling your CD. You don't you get a you don't get a CD royalty for selling every CD. You get a sale. You made a sale, just like if you make a T-shirt, you get a sale. So that has nothing to do with royalties. But we have PRO performance royalties. Also with performance royalties, the reason it's called performance royalties literally pays you for performances. So if you go to the Carnegie Hall and you perform, you better believe there's someone writing down every performance there. If Beyonce's there or if you're there, they're going to be writing down what you are doing and reporting it back to the PROs. I know this because when I was doing my master's, we had this composition thing over at um, the Disney Hall here in Orlando, um, Dr. Phillips Center. And we played in one of the bigger, you know, things there. And before we performed, my composition um, professor said, make sure you register with BMI at, or your PRO as a classical composer. I didn't know what that meant. But apparently, you're not covered for classical performances with BMI unless you register separately as a classical performance. Because most classical music money and royalties, or a lot of royalties, is made by live events because there's a lot of live play of, right. of of classical. All this to say, when when Beyonce goes and plays at a at a stadium, um, well, let me get back to my example. I know because I got seventy five bucks for my writer side and seventy five bucks for my per, my. I have a publishing company, my publishing side, just for playing for yeah. a six minute piece on this stage, and it was played. It was directed directly reported to P, to my PRO, and I got paid, and that was cool. And so, if you are an artist who is doing live work, sometimes you will get um, some. You can report where you play and get royalties. If you're playing at bars and and especially if you're playing at higher end halls and performance centers and things like that. These performance royalties should be paying you. You should be reporting this to your PRO and saying, hey, we played here, 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 and here. And uh, those places play, pay cover licenses to, be, to BMI and ASCAP so that they can let every kind of music play. You wonder how they can play all this music in there. Well, they 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 are it's it's like having a liquor license. <laughs> they have a, yeah. a BMI <laughs> or ASCAP license. So um, that's performance royalties, and that that's a short kind of little bit on that. Then there's mechanical royalties. Now, in the United States now, um, there's a couple of different ways to get mechanical royalties. You can get mechanical royalties if a label wants to release your, your music. 
and they will and they're going to make they're going to put you on streaming let's say they make vinyl let's let's see what say they make cd for fun gosh the way it's going they might even make cassettes just for novelty things and for every one of those things that's made for every stream they think is going to go out for every well streaming is kind of change now but for every um for every download they think is going to happen if downloads still happen um they are going to pay you a royalty and that's called a mechanical royalty it's like the old days of making a mechanical thing making a record making a cassette making a cd those were mechanically made so those are mechanical royalties and but uh when we had the modernization act of 20 something um they decided they wanted to start to clean this up. They're still trying to clean all this up, royalties, and especially in the digital age. So for mechanical royalties from DSPs, from Spotify, Apple, all those uh, DSPs that we listen to, there is now an organization in the United States called the, the MLC, the Mechanical Licensing Collective, and they collect uh, mechanical royalties from Spotify and from all these other places. Now, um, it, they, mine are tiny uh, little checks, like $5 checks, $10 checks. I don't, I don't really push and do a lot. I have one jazz brand on, online that's done pretty decent. But other than that, I, I, and I don't, you know, I don't, I don't follow the Andrew Southworth principles, and therefore I don't make a lot of money. If I did, I would make more. And when I have, I have. Guess what? Run an ad, it moves the meter. Duh. I mean, it's like, wow, how about that? <laughs> so I, I told someone to go there, and they went. So, uh, but there's, so there, that's mechanical royalties, and then we have sync royalties, which we've talked about a little bit with. Uh, with getting your music into television. And like I said, that could be a, a I got a, a three-digit check last week from one of my libraries that was for, you know, um, a pay, money that was paid to use the song, not not the stuff that's going to pay me in the back end on my PRO, performance royalties. Because what the cool thing about sync licensing, here's another plus, you get not only uh, an upfront fee sometimes, sometimes, but you also get a back end pay. So you could theoretically... Like I made 150 bucks for some song that played somewhere in China or someplace in Hong Kong or something, but I could also get 150 bucks in the back end for that song. And it's kind of the gift that right. keeps on giving because you're just going to continue to get more royalties as it's played more and more. And so it's kind of like radio used to be, um, and, and it still is. Like I said, I'm holding a sound exchange check in my hands right now. This is, um, I guess you would call this... Don't know what sound exchange royalties are called if they are, I guess they're a form of performance rights, but sound exchange yeah. only collects from non-interactive streamers. So like we're talking Pandora, we're talking iHeartRadio, and especially thing. Sirius. I have seen okay. people with $5,000 sound, sound exchange checks before that have been like played a lot on some of the bigger like watercolors. I, I'm also have been involved in the jazz world for about 20 years and one of my jazz artists had has had songs on watercolors, and that is the Golden Goose. You get that, that's six grand. You know, that's just wow. you're, if you get a recurring song on there, that's money on your sound exchange. And I've seen that when I had a kind of a top thirty Billboard hit with my jazz group ten years ago, and I saw thousands came in off of that over the course of time. I wasn't on uh, Pandora, but from regular radio back when there was. I guess there was regular radio at one point. Um, but uh, so those are, so sync is is the royalties. And then there are something called neighboring rights, which is, I won't bore you. If you're interested in neighboring rights, I have a, a video on my channel where I talk to a guy in Prague who runs a company that collects neighboring rights. And it's something we don't get here in the States. We don't have neighboring rights because we didn't sign something called the Rome Convention. And so, but German companies and Denmark and all these companies, not UK, but a lot of companies, uh, they have these, what they call CMOs, which are, I can't remember the name of it, some, a collective music organization or something like that. And they collect uh, the something called a, if you're involved in the record in any way, um, there could be money uh, waiting for you over there. But I would really concern yourself more with performance royalties, mechanical royalties, and and, and sync royalties. Those are the big three, really. Mm -hmm. um, there's other little royalties. I think content ID 
is kind of a new royalty stream that now we have to talk about. Because yeah. let's say you don't do licensing, but you put your music up on YouTube and it finds itself on YouTube music. I mean, sorry, you put your stuff up on through DistroKid and you go out through DistroKid and they put it everywhere and then they put it to YouTube music and somebody finds it on YouTube music, they download it somehow, or you know, they can download from just about anywhere if they're, if they're savvy enough. And then they use it on a video and that video gets a million views. You still need to be in Content ID to collect the user-generated content, not, not YouTube music content. That's more like Spotify content. I'm talking about right. user-generated stuff and they used your song for the whole five-minute video or 10-minute video or something. And then you could, your Content ID could, could say, hey, this, they didn't pay to use this song. And they just, they just yeah. download it off something and, and, and now they're using it. So an artist wants to get paid all their royalties for this song they just released. They throw it in the distributor, and that's their sales. Mm -hmm. They register for YouTube content ID through the distributor or through another entity. Yeah. They throw it up on a PRO like BMI or ASCAP. And I guess I'll just talk American artist just mm -hmm. to make it easier. <laughs> and then they throw it up for the mechanical side. That would be Song Trust, right? No, no. The M in, in the U.S., it's the M it's MLC. The MLC. Is so would someone sign up with the yeah. MLC? Yeah, you kind of That's sign your songs up there as like a publisher. You become your own. If you have a publishing company like I do, you sign your publishing company up. If you don't, you you still sign yourself up as the publisher, and um, they gotcha. will collect. I, I wouldn't get your hopes up that this is a great big income stream off MLC, especially yeah. if you're not streaming millions or th hundreds of thousands of streams. But if you are... You should be on there. Are you on there? Are no, you on MLC? Even, you need to be no, on MLC, my friend. Thing, so you just said it. MLC. I, I have BMI and I have Song Trust now, and Sound Exchange. Song. I don't know if Song Trust. Now, Song Trust is different because they're not like BMI. They're they're a company that goes out and finds all the money from the places. Now I don't know yeah. if they work with the MLC to collect that for you. I know that they will work with your with your PRO. And uh, I kind of like to control all those things myself, so I just sign up for all of them myself and get all the sound exchanges gotcha. straight to me and get all this, you know, the BMI stuff straight to me and all the MLC stuff straight to me and all the content ID straight to me. I like to get it all coming straight to me. But if you, if yeah. you're, if you don't know about all these things, uh, they are next on my list. Have you ever done a, a, a video with them, with SongTrust? Yeah. Yeah, I did. A, they sponsored a video recently, like three months ago or something. Did you talk to them, or did they just sponsor the video? Uh, I talked to them. I mean, I, I had a call. I did. They. Had, I didn't have them on the channel or anything to like talk about. But I they did send do. me a bunch of resources, and I talked to one of the members of their team for an hour, just like poke their brain. Okay. Um, and like for the gist I got was that they go and they're an aggregator where they go and collect all these rights for you, mm -hmm. and then obviously you pay them an upfront fee to sign up, and then they take a certain cut. I think. 15%, yeah. I think, was their cut. Mm -hmm. And I know that they were saying, oh, you should also register with your PRO. Mm -hmm. We're going to go collect PRO stuff, but not only are we going to do the U.S. stuff, we're going to go and get the international stuff yeah. that you would have to go do a lot of work to collect. But I think there was also the mechanical side that they collect too. Yeah. I, I haven't I really done enough due diligence there because I don't use – I do all those things myself, but I need to because a lot of people ask me about song trust all the time. I did find out that neighboring rights are not collected by song trust. That was one of the things I did find out, uh, not only from the guy I was talking to, but from song trust themselves. They, they, I emailed them and asked them if they collect neighboring rights. So uh, that's another. That's kind of a. That's kind of a little uh, really background um, income as, or I should say, licensing. And or yeah. uh, royalty thing. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't really concern yourself with that. Make sure sign up with a PRO if you're not. Sign up with Content ID if you're not. That that yeah. to me are the big ones. And if you're really doing well on streaming, sign up for the MLC because there is money waiting for you from them. Just like with Sound Exchange, the first time I got something from them, I had uh, it's like a seven hundred fifty dollar check because they just held it for years, and I'd had a radio hit that had played somewhere that was collected yeah. and so you know how many years retroactively will a pro hold royalties do you know i don't uh i, I know that <laughs> lately i've been hearing like three two or three years on some things but i don't know if bmi holds 
how much BMI holds them for you. Um, some of them, you like Content ID holds nothing. They they don't start scanning until you yeah. employ them. And same with your like. And by the way, let me just say this about Content ID because you you said this a minute ago. You can sign up with your distributor. You could sign up with somebody like Identify. And I'm not being paid to say this yet. I hope one day they'll they'll pay me to say it. <laughs> but I'm not being paid to say this. But uh, I just prefer a place that really focuses on the one thing. And I can't imagine, and listen, I love DistroKid as much as you do. They have sponsored several of my videos as well, and I use them almost only. But I just don't see DistroKid doing as hard a job going out and collecting you, um, the YouTube user-generated stuff as a company that only does that. Identify, that's all they do. Yeah. They don't do any other job. So DistroKid has a DistroKid's million things DistroKid's also pretty offer. expensive for content ID. Yeah, well. and I don't like the way they, have, they charge every Seven year for it. Seven years mm -mm. per song. No. Go, um, con, uh, go to okay. Identify. It'll cost you nothing. It, it's a three-year deal. Yeah. Once your stuff's in there, you, you really can't like sign it somewhere else. To like license, you know, some of the sync licensing people, they will want if you sign a deal with them. I mean, I mean, you're signing a literal music publishing deal, just like you would have mm. in the '80s or '90s with a music publisher. 50-50 music publishing deal, uh, split up front, split any, you know, you're the writer, they're the publisher. It's it's yeah. a it's a standard publishing deal, like like I wanted when I was you know 18 years old. <laughs> That's all I ever wanted, and now I got it. So. Anyway. Yeah, I honestly wouldn't be surprised if DistroKid and other distributors who offer it are just going to some of these dedicated companies and employing their services Maybe. to manage it for yeah. them. Maybe. Because there's probably a couple companies that own the software that does this and then they just sell it. <laughs> I know City Baby has handed it off. I know um, a couple other companies. I think um, uh, uh, Symphonic, I just reviewed their services. They came to me to do a video and... Uh, they hand it off to some company. And so does TuneCore, I think. I think they both mm. hand it off to, I can't remember the name of the company, but yeah. Yeah. But so, yeah. What, what other advice outside of what we talked about thus far would you have for, I guess, specifically artists? <laughs> you know, the one thing that I see that most, the disturbing trend now, Andrew, that we're in, and um, you're not helping it. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, you, you're, <laughs> but we're telling people to do one song and put it out and do an ad, do an advertising campaign and then do another song and put it out. There is nothing more that I hate as a music lover than going then finding a hearing a playlist and hearing this artist in there going, oh, awesome! I want. Let's see what else they've done, and go into their page and they have two songs. And I think this is where we're falling down a little bit. I know, I'm not saying you got to do 10 song albums every year, but put some music out. I mean, work on this craft and get music out. Hey, if you want to get in licensing and you want to make money from it, you're not going to make it with two songs. You're not going to make it with 20 songs. I have a goal in the next five years to get 2,000 songs out there. That's how you make six figures or, or you know, big money in licensing. The reason I do okay in stock and I continue to kind of stay at a certain amount of money there on that little side income is because I continue to put music in there. I've got hundreds of files in there. And uh, it, the more you put in is the more possible things that they can find. And Spotify is no different. Yeah. I lost you for a second. Yeah. Oh, I think you hear me now. It, I hear you. The, I just don't see you. It's probably just the video it's still recording. Fine. Okay, I agree. <laughs> but it's probably you, you hear, if you hear me good, then I'll I'll just keep talking. The video yeah, I hear should you. fix itself. I hear you fine. The uh, general best way for Spotify and other streaming services nowadays is release new songs every four to eight weeks, and so that means every year you're dropping between uh, six and nine new songs, and so and then often you'll kind of bundle them together in an album. And the purpose of that is you want to have music just continuously being dropped because every song is going to perform differently. The algorithm is going to treat it differently. And also, as you said, you need to build a catalog if you mm -hmm. want anything to happen. Mm -hmm. Because every song you promote, you, you invest some cash into promoting it or, or not cash, just like time and resources, making content to drive people to it. Once yeah. you're done making that content, a certain percentage of people are going to keep listening to it for months or years. 
So you get a recurring revenue stream from each song. So when you have 50 songs, your recurring revenue stream is greater than when you have two. <laughs> and then I, I know someone who has like 800 songs on his Spotify and he's releasing like 50 a month. Now it's instrumental piano music. Mm-hmm. So, it, and you can do it all on a keyboard. There's no vocals. There's not like a big production budget. Mm-hmm. Um, but that kind of shows you how, you know, the, the volume thing helps. <laughs> And yeah. other people I know release music every two weeks or one week in my case. Hey, the, what you just described is what I've been doing with artists for especially the past five years, even through COVID, you know, the 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 four the six to eight week strategy where you're you're releasing something and you're 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 doing enough to put new music out and have something to talk about and you're doing but you're not doing it so much that it's bugging people and you're you're writing that line somewhere between what your audience wants from you do they want more faster or do they want <laughs> they like you know you yeah. just gave us a song last week we we get the deal you're you're a singer but um <laughs> i've dealt with on the artist side with people and and that's and it's a good release strategy i still do it for people you know we make a video we release the single and then we release the video and and you can for a couple of weeks you have this marketing campaign you can do all good. And I don't mind that. I don't mind that at all. But even that's hard to stick to sometimes. And and you yeah. can get caught in a trap and then life gets hard and things happen. And then you haven't released anything in a year. And so um, I tend to drop albums only because I create so much because I, I just make a bunch of songs and I'm making them for stock and those are all non-exclusive. I can do whatever I want with them. And I put them up to Spotify in bunches, you know, across all these different um, these different yeah. kind of brands. But uh, I just think quantity is something that you've, uh, that's the only downside of, of our releasing singles is only having a couple of songs to show for yourself. And you've, you've either got to be in this for the, you've got to be in this for the long haul. You've got to keep doing it. You've got to keep working it. And that's the difference between the people who have success and the people who don't have success. Just like I said before, you've got to just, you got to keep at it. You got to keep doing it. You got to keep putting out more. So the last words I put in my students' ear: keep doing music, even when you, you know, it, when you leave this class, don't just stop making music because you have to go off and do engineering stuff now, rather than than MIDI yeah. stuff. Keep keep making beats. Keep making music of some kind. If you are, if that's who you are, some people just don't care to make new music. They just want to perform. And that's cool right. too. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of cool paths you can take yeah. in music. Like some people end up starting, they, they want to be an artist and then they find out that they could have other people hire them to do their production and mixing and mastering. And they realize that they love that and they like it more. Uh, and then they just stop make releasing their own music because they, yeah. they find this other path. Or they teach, or they they they're a session musician, or mm-hmm. they're a live. I know someone who's who's a guitar tech for a relatively big band. That's how he makes his living touring yeah. the country, um, and he still releases music. Yeah. And and then I talk to these other people who they're just like career techs and touring yeah. people, and they've made a living off of for two decades and sure. working for all these crazy amazing artists, going to these amazing places. And I would hate that because I'm kind of a homebody. Yeah. But like some people would hate. They hate the idea of sitting in front of a computer or being in the studio. They want to like go out and see the world and play in front mm-hmm. of people. Or they love that stage and they love the yeah. the feeling of connecting with people in the audience. And then there are people I know engineers in Nashville who just like their their. I mean, they love going out to a big studio where they get to run a big board and and like the old days, patch that yeah. sucker up and record an orchestra. But they also love the days where they sit at home alone and 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 mix yeah. and for weeks, you know, and uh it, it's it's their thing. And you know what those people, they're not they're not music artists at all. They're not songwriters, they're not composers, and they don't miss it. They because they've <laughs> never done it, because they're technical people. And we need them too, for sure. You know, not everybody has to be like us. I'm the artist. I'm the chief bottle washer. I make all the videos. I do this. I produce it. I mix it. You know, we're 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 probably the weirdos. But uh, I think we're uh, more people are weirdos these days than ever, just because yeah. you can create it yourself. So, well, Eric. Thanks for coming on. Hey, it's man. Awesome. It's I'm going to have fun. all your links in the description for yeah. people to check it out or the show notes if you're listening to this in the podcast version. Uh, cool. Yeah, makemusicincome.com is your main website. Yeah. And then yeah. you have another one that's 
Hello. It's called HelloComposers.com. Yeah. HelloComposers.com. So. That's my, that's my um, you know, that's the redheaded stepchild right now. But I, 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 <laughs> as soon as I get done with one of these masterminds I've been doing, I'm going to get back to it. And I've got a plan for content for it. You know how it is. We could come up with a different site every week, Andrew. It's so easy. There's so many ideas yeah. and there's so little time. But uh, yeah, those are my main two sites. So come on over, folks. Cool, man. Well, All right. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Thanks so much, man. <laughs> Talk to you next time.